There really are not any good diagnostic procedures for evaluating tra mild traumatic brain injury. Uh, th this is basic doctoring. This is basically being a good doctor. This is recording symptoms, taking a history, and trying to connect the dots and figure out you know, where the symptoms came from. And again, if the symptoms are those of concussion and one can work backwards and find evidence of injury, you've made a pretty good case. If you don't have a good history, uh, it's very difficult to make some final decisions. And so in examining these individuals, you really have to take time and you have to get a lot of information concerning their pre-morbid functioning, how they're doing, and then you need to lead up to this question of exactly what happened to you uh, at the time you were injured. Have you had a blow to your head? Or, and if they say no, then I come back and I ask them specifics. Anybody hit you recently? Did you fall and hit your head? Were you in a car accident? Any sporting event happened where you got hit in the head? any of those kinds of things to make sure you're not missing it. It's easy to not think of those. It's easy to just think, oh, they're a little depressed, they're under stress, those kinds of things. And to be honest, most of the time that's probably what it's going to be. But the risk of missing the brain injury is potentially devastating to somebody who's really had one. So I would encourage anybody, who's any, any physician who's got a client who's coming in and the questions, the, the symptom presentation includes cognitive changes. It never hurts to ask two or three questions about blows to the head to make sure that hasn't been missed. Take a careful history. Ask, was there truly a disruption of consciousness? Was there truly some disorientation to the environment if there was no disruption in consciousness? If yes, how long did it last? What are the symptoms that followed that and how long did it take for them to resolve? Those are the kinds of questions that should be asked. It's important to think about that patient in the global context. First and foremost would be the cognitive arena. How is that patient functioning? Has there been a change in their cognition that the physician can relate to? Is the patient complaining of changes in cognition or awareness? The second issue would be that of emotional aspects. Is there a change in the emotionality in the patient? Is there a depressive mood? Has something changed in that patient or is the patient complaining of some type of emotional change? Third would be behavioral changes. Aggressive, impulsive, and impulsive behaviors are often associated with mild traumatic brain injury. You want to take a broad look across everything. It's, it's difficult because you're being asked to do a very thorough evaluation. There's no one key indicator to whether or not they've had a brain injury. Because of this, phenomenon of post-traumatic amnesia. You know, people don't remember clearly events ar around the injury. Uh, people may not always remember and they may not always be ready to report uh, these kind of events. So uh, anytime I think you can get a, a family member or, or another witness uh, to corroborate this, uh, it's, it's very useful. You know, I think as a general practitioner, a family practitioner wades into this realm, uh, I'd, I'd really recommend that they consult the CDC website, which has an excellent short exam for brain injury, so I think uh, called the ACE. And I think as, uh, uh, as the suspicion of a concussion emerges, it's really worth, worth uh, your while to have your nurse go to the CDC website, print out the one page evaluation and go through it point by point, point in order to uh, make the evaluation. Patient intake sheets can be a useful tool for flagging the primary care physician that there's a problem they need to attend to. S unfortunately, most physician intake tools for their private practices do not have questions on it about brain function. We'll screen for all kinds of other organ systems, but we don't have specific questions about memory changes, concentration changes, emotional changes related to brain function. And if those questions are there, they don't also ask, has there been a blow to the head? Have you been in a car accident? Have you had the kinds of things that would identify those symptoms as related to brain injury? So I would encourage primary care physicians to include on their physician intake sheets or patient intake sheets those kinds of questions. I think the, the impact of, of identification early is that you've basically created a safety net for somebody. The, and basically you help them avoid failure. You've also 
reduce the likelihood of them having years of basically years of unneeded anxiety and fear about what was wrong with them. I think you basically can save money by screening because you're essentially screening as a form of prevention. For some reason, I think a lot of uh, general practice physicians are reluctant to make a diagnosis of traumatic brain injury. Uh, Although oftentimes they're in an ideal situation to do so, or in an ideal position to do so. You know, they, they have the information about the injury, they know the patient well, they can see changes. And like any good, you know, medical evaluation, making that diagnosis, even if it's a provisional or a working diagnosis, is, is, is important, you know, getting it in the differential. Uh, so I think if there is suspicion of traumatic brain injury, it needs to go on the doctor's report. It needs to be coded appropriately. You know, a general ICD-9 code like 854 uh, works quite well. There may be others you know, that are a little bit more specific depending on individual symptoms, but by and large, I use 854. If there's not a clear diagnosis, uh, you know, oftentimes people ha can't get insurance coverage, you know, for uh, the treatment that they need. So having, having that diagnosis on the record is, is very important. When we talk about acquired brain injury, we, that, that can be secondary to brain tumor, that can be secondary to aneurysmal rupture or stroke. And when you look at that compared to mild traumatic brain injury or traumatic brain injury in general, the symptoms and signs can certainly overlap. When we talk about neurologic sequelae from any type of acquired brain injury, they can be due to either traumatic or non-traumatic causes. So there's a great deal of overlap. And again, when you're thinking about or entertaining the diagnosis of traumatic brain injury, that's where imaging might come into play, where we can help distinguish between an acquired organic cause of, of brain injury as opposed to that which is sustained secondary to trauma. Substance abuse, TBI, basically, that it's, it's really easy to differentiate between substance abuse and the TBI. It's also, you can differentiate between TBI and depression. Okay, the, the, you can use psychiatric instruments, you can use all kinds of instruments to do those di differential diagnoses. It's not always clear whether the psychiatric disorder is a result of the traumatic brain injury or the psychiatric disorder puts you at increased risk for getting a traumatic brain injury. But there have been studies in depression and anxiety and post-traumatic stress disorder and schizophrenia that all show that there's a relationship between traumatic brain injury and the psychiatric disorder. A complicating factor is that there's an interaction between having a psychiatric disorder and how you do after the brain injury. It appears, for example, that if you're depressed, your symptoms of traumatic brain injury are worse, and your, even your performance on neuropsychological tests is more impaired than if you had a traumatic brain injury and you did not have depression. We're beginning to recognize that individuals may develop both traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress disorder. This is becoming extremely obvious because of our soldiers who are fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, it is sometimes difficult to tease apart which symptoms may be from post-traumatic stress disorder and which from traumatic brain injury because the symptoms actually overlap. Traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress disorder share some symptoms and then there are some symptoms that are unique to either traumatic brain injury or, or PTSD. So for example, uh, depression, anxiety, fatigue, sleep problems would be common to both uh, TBI and PTSD. Uh, nightmares, uh, the feeling of re-experiencing the traumatic event, that would be more common with uh, PTSD and is not generally found or should not be found in in the traumatic brain injury. Um, while some cognitive problems can be found in post-traumatic stress disorder, um, you know, some of the other physical symptoms such as headache, uh, vestibular problems, visual problems would not be found in post-traumatic stress disorder but would be found in traumatic brain injury.